Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's live stream devotional and Bible study. Today we are going to be reading about the plot to destroy the Jews in Esther chapter 3. Um, and if you're just hearing the title, you're like, oh, what? Christians are talking about destroying the Jews? What is this? Um, this is uh, from the Old Testament. And I am going to invite you to actually read along. Uh, we are uh, still nearing the beginning of the book of Esther. Um, and kind of what this book has been, what's been happening in this book thus far, is you have this Persian king that threw this really, really big party and then he wanted to parade his wife around in front of all of his party goers. And she was like, I don't want to go there. And then people were like, are you going to let your wife speak to you like that? Are you going to let your wife do that? Think about how that's going to disrupt all of the households in all of Persia because your wife said no to you. So then the king's like, yeah, you know what? You're right. Forget her. Banish her. And I'm going to have a beauty contest where I get to sleep with women for a year and choose which one's going to be my queen. And um, after like a year of preps and, and getting all dolled up and everything, um, Esther has her night with the king. And the king is absolutely blown away by her. And uh, makes Esther the queen. Esther is a Jewish girl who is um, the niece, I believe, of Mordecai. Um, and Mordecai was like, hey, don't just go around being like, hey, I'm a Jewish lady, I'm a Jewish lady, I'm a Jewish lady. Um, just, you know, keep that on the DL for now. And um, that's what Esther did. And as uh, Mordecai was going to check up on his niece and who he was raising as if uh, um, Esther was his own daughter because Esther's parents, I believe, died. I forget how. Um, I, yeah, I'm drawing a blank on how. I don't even know if it, the Bible said how. But anyways, uh, Mordecai is um, there with, um, like, listening, trying to talk to Esther, and... Um, he overhears a plot of a couple people trying to plot to kill the Persian king Xerxes. So uh, he then gets the attention of Esther again and is like, hey, you know, this is what's going on. Did he tell Esther himself? I, anyway, he got word to the king. He got the word to King Xerxes. And um, then uh, they got impaled on a tree. The two people that were plotting to uh, assassinate and overthrow King Xerxes. So Mordecai saved the king's life. Um, and that is where we are going to be starting again. Um, I was real smart and I left my Bible uh, in my office at like the door and I'm at my home office right now. So, uh, I'm doing what I have said so many times before, and that's, uh, I've opened up to got BibleGateway.com, um, and I'm reading under the New Living Translation, and since, you know, we're all online and have everything like that, I'm just gonna paste, uh, the link to what I'm reading, where I'm reading from in the comments, but use, uh, the Bible app, and if you have, uh, your own, uh, Bible, uh, you know, physical Bible. I just, I, I like having that physicality of a Bible, so it's going to be a little bit weird for me. Um, but if you want your own physical Bible, I'd love to hook you up with one. But there's so many great ways to have digital ones as well. So, um, you know, don't be afraid of those either. Um, so, yeah, if I'm like, if you're like, why is he looking up so often? Um, I maybe you can improve that. What if I go like this? Sorry, I didn't even think about this till just now. Yeah, kind of, you know, a normal way of doing it <laughs> instead of the way that I have it. Um, now you get to see my books and DVDs and such. Anyways, um, yeah. So uh, without further ado, let's jump in to 
Esther, chapter 3. Sometime later, King Xerxes promoted Haman, son of Hamadatha, uh, the Agitite, over all the other nobles, making him the most powerful official in the empire. All the king's officials would bow down before Haman to show him respect whenever he passed by, for the king had commanded, um, uh, for so the king had commanded. But Mordecai refused to bow down or show respect. Then the palace officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, Why are you disobeying the king's command? They spoke to him day after day, but still he refused to comply with the order. So they spoke to Haman about this, to see if he would tolerate Mordecai's conduct, since Mordecai had told them he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not bow down or show him respect, he was filled with rage. He had learned of Mordecai's nationality, so he decided it was not enough to lay hands on Mordecai alone. Instead, he looked for a way to destroy all the Jews throughout the entire empire of King Xerxes. So, in the month of April, during the twelfth year of King Xerxes' reigns, lots were cast in Haman's presence. The lots were called pre Purim. Uh, basically, these things were basically like dice. Uh, from my research, uh, to determine the best day and month to take action. And the day selected was March 7th, nearly a year later. Then Haman approached uh, King Xerxes and said, There's a certain race of people scattered throughout all the provinces of your empire who keep themselves separate from everyone. Their laws are different from those of any other people, and they refuse to obey the laws of the king. So, it is not in the king's interest to let them live. If it pleases the king, issue a decree that they will be destroyed, and I will give one, uh, and I will give ten thousand large uh, sacks of silver to the government. Um, administrators to be deposited in the royal treasury. The king agreed, confirming his decision by removing his signet ring from his finger and giving to Haman, son of Hemadetha, the agitite, the enemy of the Jews. The king said, the money and the people are both yours to do with as you see fit. So on April 7th, uh, 17th, the king's secretaries were summoned, and a decree was written exactly as Haman uh, dictated. It was sent to the king's highest uh, officers, uh, governors of the respective provinces, and the nobles of each province in their own scripts and languages. The decree was written in the name of King Xerxes and sealed with the king's signet ring. Dispatches were sent by swift messengers into all provinces of the empire, giving the order that all Jews, young and old, including women and children, must be killed, slaughtered, and annihilated on a single day. This was scheduled to happen on March 7th of the next year. The property of the Jews would be given to those killed them. A copy of this decree was to be issued as law in every province and proclaimed to all people so that they would be ready to do their duty on the appointed day. At the king's command, the decree went out by swift messengers, and it was proclaimed in the fortress of Susa. The king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa fell into confusion. May God add a blessing to the reading of Esther chapter
three. Um, yeah, so you have this one guy, Haman, who rises the ranks and is now the king's number one, and he demands respect from everyone. But then there's this one guy. One guy who... Uh, he doesn't even see, just hears back that this guy uh, wasn't bowing down, wasn't treating him in the best of ways. And um, pride just fills Haman's heart and he becomes blind. He's like, I'm going to pay back and I'm going to destroy all of those people. And then has a conversation with the king and kind of makes his issue about the king. Oh, these guys don't respect you, king. They don't respect you. Meanwhile, it was all actually about King Haman. So he twisted and manipulated the facts. Oh, he's not going to bow down to me. Therefore, he disrespects you, Lord. So why don't you come up with a plan to have them killed? Like, say, make a decree on March 7th that every Jew man, woman, and child must be slaughtered. Like, why don't you do something like that? And if King Xerxes, and the rest of the story is to believe, he's probably drunk and was like, yeah, whatever you want, hey man, I trust you, bud. But he probably was like, yeah, I, I, like, he had trust in Haman, right? Uh, to look out for his best interest and the best interest of the kingdom. So, um, King Xerxes put his trust in King Haman and sure enough because this guy with such immense power at the time uh, gave the green light without really thinking it through not having that wise counsel now the lives of many are in danger especially the life of Mordecai the one who saved King Xerxes very life in the last chapter um so yeah uh interestingly there's a couple things here that i think are very interesting and a couple of really cool um foreshadows to jesus in my opinion uh one we have mordecai's life on the line to save others so and like jesus standing up for what was right was something that ended up leading to his death uh, in order to save many. So you have uh, Mordecai here who, um, you know, uh, saved the king's life. And he sees this other guy rising up and getting all the praise and everything like that. And Mordecai doesn't want to bow down to him. He wants to only bow down to, you know, the Lord. And um, this has gotten many Jewish people in trouble before. But Mordecai overreacts and he takes his pride, uh, this thing, and he wants to kill all the Jewish people. This is something that we've seen time and time again um, in a lot of the Old Testament stuff. Um, Kings 18 comes to mind. But the wa reason why this so foreshadows like Jesus in, in my mind as I'm reading this is that whole he came to save and then he stood up for what was right and then got persecuted by people in higher power. And then, uh, yeah, that made his life on the line. And this is something that we've seen with the Jewish people throughout history. Uh, think of World War II even. That came to mind as I was reading this. Uh, that somebody gets so upset at one person in that people group that they want to kill all the people in that people group. We have a tendency as human beings, when we're wronged by someone that is an other, uh, we paint that whole other group as evil and wrong. And um, this is a story where the people that were reading it, they were the other. They are the ones that are the other, that are getting persecuted by the powerful. And when we read it, uh, especially as Christians, we are supposed to take the side of Mordecai. We're supposed to understand Mordecai and relate to Mordecai here. 
we are to take our role in the story, I believe, as the other. The one that is standing up trying to do the right thing and getting persecuted for it. Just like Jesus. The other thing that makes this whole story of Mordecai like Jesus is it was a bunch of silver that paid for the deaths of all of the Jews. And Jesus, um, you know, um, famously was betrayed with per 30 pieces of silver. And so I don't know if the numbers break down, but that was just one of those other things that stood out to me. So what's the big take home? Instead of being angry at whoever, whoever that other people group is, um, we should learn to love, forgive, to help, uh, and not paint everyone in that other group with such a vicious brush. Um, we should try to understand and identify with the other as they're coming in with different religions, different practices, different upbringings, and treat said people with such, with respect. And I think that's one of the big reasons why in North America we have the religious freedoms that we do have. Because when the people that were making the laws and everything, they would read stories like this from the Bible and go, that wasn't right. We don't want to make those mistakes again. I hope. I think. I don't know. Uh, but, yeah. And the other thing, the other big takeaway from this is doing the right thing doesn't mean that it's going to make life easy. Especially short term. In the last chapter, Mordecai saved the king and did the right thing and was like, hey, there's a plot to kill you. And now he's getting punished and sentenced to death by the very king that he saved. But he still did the right thing. Sometimes in life, when we do the right thing, it can feel as if we are punished for it. But God sees it. God knows what's happening here in the book of Esther. God is not named by name in the book of Esther. But his hands and his fingerprints are all over it. Um, so if you want to know what happens, you can go back to when we read through chapter one, because I think I said it. But um, I think we're going to leave it there. The, I like that it's left on this mystery that on March 7th, all the Jews are going to die. And the clock is So let's pray. AJC, awesome Jesus Christ. I thank you for the book of Esther. Um, I thank you for the lessons that we can pull out of this tragic story, this heart-wrenching story where someone that stood up to do good, that saved somebody's life, is now having their life in jeopardy. Not only their life, but the lives of all of their people in jeopardy by the one that they came to save. So, Lord, help us to surround ourselves with good counsel. Counsel that's not just interested in their soul, own self-interest, but in the benefit of us and those around us. And help us to have that kind of heart for them. Lord, help, to, help us to not paint the other with such brushes as Haman did in this instance. And we have a tendency to do that uh, throughout history. It's, it's part of our sinful nature. One that comes out and we hold strong to without even really realizing it or knowing why or how. So Lord, help us to squash that and to change that hate and that disgust, disgust and that distrust into love. And I thank you so much that we, or at least I, 
people <laughs> watch this sometimes from many other countries, but here in Southern Ontario that this is the mixing pot type deal or whatever we call it, um, where, you know, it's not uncommon to run into so many different people from so many different countries, so many different walks of life and so many different religions and that we can just come together um, and that we can show love. And I thank you that Christians are the ones that reach outside of their community the most to show love, honor, and respect, to offer help. There are more programs owned by Christians that help people of other faiths than any other faith group. Um, if, yeah, um, I want to prove that fact now, Lord, but you know that fact. Um, and I, I, I don't, I can't bring it up now that I'm in the middle of the prayer, but I thank you for that, Lord. Um, so yeah, the wise counsel, the, the not painting others, Lord, and, um, help us to not tire in doing good. The world right now is just, it feels so dire. We're coming out of the pandemic. There's threat of nuclear war. There's so many personal things going on, so many global things going on. And life is tough. But Lord, I can't imagine what it's like to live life without you. So Lord, guide us, direct us, help us to offer your hope and extend your love. Help us to do what is right and to love mercy and to walk humbly with you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, uh, so that is it for today. Have a fantastic day. God bless.